the least likely person to be singled out by God in scripture. I mean, she was a woman in a patriarch society. She was a slave girl. She was, you know, again, a foreigner. She probably worshiped other gods and she wasn't really seeking God when he sought her out. I love knowing that Hagar was the only person in the Bible that gave God a name. And that name was El Roy, which means he is a God who sees me. I'm drawn to her because she's been honest with God. And I know we're invited. I'm invited to be honest with God. The Lord drew near and he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai. He named her. And I think God draws near and he knows my name. I think this story really shows us how personal God is and how faithful He is. When God pursued Hagar, He initiated contact with her. He talked with her. He asked her questions. He referred to her by name. But when she met God, she realized He was a safe place for her. And I'm not in control of my life either, but God is a safe place to go. I realize that this is something that I can take away that I have a God that sees me. I have a God that sees me in my wilderness, in the desert, when I don't think anybody else sees me. I'm just really thankful that now I see him too. Well, I uh, have to apologize as I begin because I want to start off with some very unsettling news. That is that next month is my 50th high school reunion. <laughs> uh, here I am in the, I see your photo in my high school yearbook, 1974, check out the 70s vibe there. I graduated in 1974 in June. Two months later, my family moved a thousand miles away and in all the years in between, I've only been back to one of my reunions. That was the 30th reunion 20 years ago. And something happened at that 30th reunion that makes me a bit skittish about going to my 50th next month. Um, when I arrived uh, at that 30th reunion at the place of the first reception, uh, when I'd be seeing my old classmates for the first time in 30 years, I found myself nervous and butterflies in my stomach uh, thinking, would people remember me? Uh, would they recognize me? Would they like me? After all, it had been 30 years. So I go into the reception area at the table where they had the name tags, and I get to the table, and the woman sitting there looked like she was about my age, maybe one of my classmates, but I didn't recognize her. And she looked up at me, and she said, don't tell me, don't tell me, Lee Benedict. I said, uh, nope. She said, okay, okay, don't tell me, don't tell me. I, I, I got it, Jim Mishlack. I said, no, and then she went, I give up. So I said, I'm, I'm Brian Coffey. I mean, come on, right? <laughs> she gave me a complete blank stare. Even when I told her my name, she had no idea, no recollection whatsoever as to my existence. And I wanted to say, well, I don't really know who you are either, so we're even, but I, I didn't say that. So I'm preparing myself for the very likely possibility of a similar reaction at my 50th. Now, there's something about being unrecognized that makes you feel a bit like you're invisible, unseen, like when someone forgets your name. You feel like somehow you're not important enough to be known, and we'll see that in the story we look at today. We're in the second week of a series we're calling Women of Valor. And last week, you probably heard that that title, Women of Valor, comes from a Hebrew phrase that we find several times in the Old Testament. It's Eshet Chayil. And it comes to us in Proverbs 31.10, a wife of noble character. That phrase, noble character, is Eshet Chayil. Literally, woman of strength, woman of excellence, woman of valor. Valor, a word used often to describe a warrior. A woman of, a wife of noble character, who can find? She's worth far more than rubies. And on Mother's Day, many of us are blessed enough to be able to honor our moms, whether they're still with us or whether they've gone ahead, uh, as being women of strength, women of excellence, women of valor. Last week, Pastor Joe started us off with the story of Ruth. And we also see this phrase in Ruth chapter 3, as Boaz says to Ruth, And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Eshet Hayil, woman of strength, 
and valor. So we're looking at four women of valor in this series, four women out of the Old Testament, and we're gonna see that each of these women's stories contains something uncomfortable, painful, unjust in some way, but that each one of them demonstrates an extraordinary and courageous faith. And in each story, God is seen to be redeeming their stories, their pain and their suffering into his own redemptive story. And today we look at a woman named Hagar and we find her story in Genesis chapter 16. Let me give you a little background before I read. So we're in Genesis, the very beginning of God's redemptive plan for and through his people. We're also stepping into a very ancient culture, a culture much different than our own. And it's hard to wrap our minds around how different it would have been. It was an extremely patriarchal culture uh, where women were valued primarily or maybe valued only as wives and producers of children. A woman who was not a wife, uh, who was a widow or who had been uh, divorced or discarded in some way was at great risk in in the ancient world. And a woman who could not have children was considered cursed. Now, Genesis also gives us the beginning of God's covenant with his people. In Genesis 12, he tells Abraham, uh, or Abram, later called Abraham, that he promises to make him the father of a great nation through whom the whole world will be blessed. But time goes by after that promise, and Abram eventually asks God about that because he and his wife Sarai, later called Sarah, have not had any children. He says, maybe God, maybe one of my servants can be my heir. And God says in chapter 15 of Genesis, no, no, no. He says, a son who is of your own flesh and blood will be born, and I'll make your descendants as many as the stars in the skies. So fast forward another 10 years or so, and we come to the story we look at today, Genesis chapter 16. I'm going to read through it, and then we'll go back and see what we can learn. I'm going to make comments here along the way. Chapter 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had had borne him no children. So as I said, it's been over 10 years since God originally promised that Abraham would have a son. And this waiting would have been enormously disappointing for them because having an heir was of utmost importance. And it would have been confusing because God had promised. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Now, you may remember in Genesis uh, that Abraham, Abram and Sarai have to flee due to a famine. They go to Egypt. While in Egypt, Abraham, Abram's concerned that since Sarai is beautiful, uh, the Egyptians will kill him and take her. And so he, he, he lies and tells her to say that she's his sister, not his wife. The Pharaoh does take her into his household, but God visits them with all sorts of diseases. Pharaoh comes back to Ab- Abram and says, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you tell me she was your sister? Gives him all sorts of animals and slaves and sends them off. And one of those slaves likely is this woman, Hagar. Now in slavery in that time, in that part of the world, usually came about because a family was stuck in poverty and they would sell one of their family members, one of their children, into servitude for money. So Hagar has evidently been sold by her own family, given then to Abram and Sarai, and now she's with them as their servant. They own her as their property. Verse 2, so she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Now, this sounds really strange to us, uh, but in the ancient world where having an heir was of utmost importance, where the value of a woman was to bear children, this was a rather common practice. So Sarai is basically suggesting a surrogate motherhood to allow Abram to have an heir and for her to have a child. And actually, uh, God had not specified earlier exactly how Abram would have a child, so Sarai decides she's going to help God out a little bit. And then we see Abram agreed to what Sarai said. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. There's a lot I could say here, but let me just point out the literal Hebrew is Abram listened to his wife. Now, guys, if you're married, we should listen to our wives. 99.9% of the time, we should listen to our wives. You know, turn down the TV, maybe mute it, listen. But this is one of those cases where you should not listen to your wife. Right? Abram should not have listened to his wife. Many commentators see this as reminiscent of of Adam's passivity in Genesis chapter 3. Remember when God comes to Adam and says, what have you done? Have you eaten from the forbidden fruit? And he kind of goes, the woman you gave me, the woman you put here with me gave me the fruit. We'll talk more about this later. Verse 3. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. 
He slept with Hagar and she conceived. So this is like an ancient Jerry Springer show. It's messy, it's troublesome, but it's here. The Bible doesn't clean up the stories of its heroes. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Okay, how many of you saw a problem coming with this whole plan? Right? You can kind of see it coming, and now it's happened. So even though it's been her idea from the beginning, and her plan actually works, Sarai now blames the whole thing on Abram, and she takes it out on him. She turns her resentment against him. Verse 6. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. So in essence, he returns Hagar to slave status and abdicates any responsibility to protect her, even though she's carrying his child. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, abused her in some way, and so she fled from her. The first thing I see uh, in this story is what I'm calling the gospel according to Sarai. The gospel according to Sarai. Now, how many of you would call yourself a do-it-yourself person? That is, you have a project around the house, painting, you know, plumbing, landscaping, and you just like the challenge of figuring out how to do it yourself. How many do-it-yourselfers do we have here? Okay, there's a few of you. Well, uh, not me. Not that I didn't try. When we bought our first house, uh, I was excited to have my own yard to take care of. And I noticed we had uh, that first spring some weeds and dandelions growing up, so I decided to take care of that myself. Went to the hardware store, bought some uh, fertilizer with the, with the weed killer in it at a, at a yard sale, got, an, got a spreader for like 50 cents, and I filled it up, and, I, and I, I went back and forth, and I just took care of that. And a couple days later, my yard looked like this. That's not actually our house, but that's exactly the way my yard looked. Uh, turns out the spreader was kind of rusty, didn't drop the stuff uh, evenly, and so I camouflaged my yard. It took about a year to fix. Let me read again the first part of the story. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. So it's been over 10 years now, maybe closer to 20 years. Sarai has grown tired of waiting for God. God had promised that Abram would have an heir, but he hasn't come through yet. So Sarai figures that she has to take God's promise into her own hands. And the gospel of Sarai is this. You can't trust God to keep his promises, so you have to do it yourself. She gives Hagar to Abram to help God keep his promise. And then we read, when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. So what's this all about? So Hagar now has a new status. She's moved from slave to wife. And now she has something that Sarai does not have and never has had, and that is a child. So the relationship changes. The Hebrew word for despise literally means to make small. So Sarai has now become small in Hagar's eyes. She no longer sees herself as totally subservient to Sarai because now she has special status. She's become the wife who can carry a child. And Sarai doesn't like Hagar's new attitude. So she takes it out on Abram first, and then she takes it out on Hagar. Verse 6 says, Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar. So she fled from her. So the sin of Sarai here is unbelief, failing to trust the promise of God. The sin of Abram is also unbelief, but in a different way, where Hagar is actively disbelieving, Abram is sort of passively Disbelieving. He abdicates his responsibility to protect both his wife and Hagar. So when Sarai comes to him with this plan, Abraham could have and should have said, no, well, no, 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 wait, time out, time out. I'm not doing that because you're my wife. God made the promise to me. I can trust God. Let's pray to him and ask him what he thinks is best. But he doesn't do that. He passively goes along with the plan. Sleep with your slave girl? 
whatever, okay, honey. And then when Sarai is upset, Abram gives Sarai permission to mistreat Hagar. So both Sarai and Abram sin against Hagar. As one preacher said it, godly people sometimes do very ungodly things. Notice neither of them ever speak to Hagar or about Hagar using her name. Sarai says, go sleep with my slave. Then she says, I put my slave in your arms. Abram says, your slave is in your hands. Hagar is not a person to Abram and Sarai. She's only a thing. She's a thing to be used in their plan, but we're going to find out she's not a thing to God. So the summary here is that the gospel according to Sarai is God cannot be trusted. You're going to have to do it yourself. And Sarai's gospel is no gospel at all because it results in sin, pain, dysfunction, and abuse. But thankfully in this story, there's another gospel. The second thing we're going to see here is the gospel according to God. Maybe you've noticed uh, this little teddy bear here. Uh, He's on the screen if you can't see him up close. Uh, He's in a little bit rough shape, this teddy bear. Uh, He's lost most of his fur. Looks like he's had a bad skin disease or something. Um, He's beat up. His ears a little crooked here. Um, You may wonder where I would find such a beat up little teddy bear. I can't imagine any child would really want this teddy bear. But uh, I didn't actually find it. I've always had it. Uh, This teddy bear was my teddy bear when I was a child. It's as old as I am, maybe older than I am. And if you tried to buy this teddy bear, I wouldn't sell it to you. If you tried to take it from me, I would fight you for it because it was mine. It belongs to me. It has value to me, if to nobody else. And in the same way, Hagar, the Egyptian slave girl, had little or no value to anyone. Not to her family in Egypt, who sold her as a slave. Not to her owners now, Abram and Sarai, who won't speak her name. But there is one, we find out, who does see in her something of great value. Verse 7, Genesis 16. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. Let me stop there. The road to Shur was evidently on the way to Egypt. Hagar is running away from Sarai's abuse, and evidently she's walking, heading back to Egypt, which was several hundred miles. The angel of the Lord finds her in the desert at a spring. Now, the angel of the Lord is an interesting phrase in the Old Testament that many scholars believe is what's called a theophany, or more accurately, a Christophany. That is, it's actually in a, a pre-incarnate appearance of a Christ figure in the Old Testament. And there are several reasons for this in the story, and I'll point to them in just a moment. In verse 8, and he said, Hagar, notice how he begins to address her. The first one in the story so far who sees her as a person addresses her by name. Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The gospel of God is, first of all, that he pursues and finds the lost. God pursues and finds the lost. Now, at this point in the story, Hagar is a runaway Egyptian slave who's been mistreated, used, and discarded. She's alone in the desert without a home and without hope. We have no evidence at this point that she worshiped Yahweh, the God of Israel. We have no evidence that she cried out to him in her distress. Yet God knows Hagar. He pursues and he finds her. This is why theologians think the phrase, the angel of the Lord, is pointing us toward a Christ figure, because this is exactly what Jesus does. In Luke 15, Jesus describes himself as the shepherd who leaves the 99 sheep in the fold and goes to search for and find the one lost sheep. Here, the angel of the Lord finds Hagar by a spring, by a well. Centuries later, Jesus would meet a Samaritan woman at a well and offer her living water. The same Jesus said in Luke chapter 19, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So I wonder today, where and when did Jesus find you? What's your story? I was listening to another preacher this week who said, the only reason any of us find Jesus 
is that he found us first. I think that's true. And maybe today he'll find you. Secondly, the gospel according to God is that he invites us into a relationship. He finds Hagar, he speaks to her by name, and then he says, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from? And where are you going? Now, why would God ask questions like this of Hagar? Does he not know? Well, of course he knows. He's not asking her for information. He's inviting her into a conversation. He's inviting her into a relationship. He invites her to confess her pain. Where have you been? How have you been hurt? He invites her to confess her hope. Where are you going? What are you hoping for? Who's going to save you? And I think God asks us the same questions. Where have you come from? What is there in your past? What pain is there? What bitterness is there? What fear or what burden do you carry with you out of that past today? And where are you going? Where is your hope anchored? Where is your life headed? Where will you wind up if you keep going the direction you're going? Thirdly, the gospel according to God is that he commands. He speaks truth. Verse 9, then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Wait, what? Go back to the place where you were mistreated? Now, just to be clear here, God is not saying that women or wives who've been mistreated must go back to their abuser. That's not the point here. This is not God's prescriptive command to all women everywhere. He's speaking to Hagar individually, personally, in her unique situation. So what's he up to here? I think here God is saving Hagar's life. I think he's preserving the life of her unborn child. But how could Hagar begin to obey this command and go back? Well, last week, Pastor Joe shared a quote from a preacher named Tony Evans who said, faith is acting as if God is telling the truth. Faith is acting like God is telling the truth. And here God is asking Hagar to trust him because he tells the truth, to trust him because he's good. And because he is good, his command is good. How often I think we allow our difficult or painful situations, our circumstances to convince us or tempt us to think that God is not good, that he does not speak the truth. Lastly, the gospel according to God is that he promises. He promises. God is asking Hagar to trust him, so he makes her a promise, beginning in verse 10. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. So Hagar's run has gone now from slave to wife back to slave again, now to runaway slave. She's been used and abused as a thing and not a person, but God has pursued her, found her, spoken her name, given her a command, and now made a promise beyond her wildest imagination. She will have a son. His name will be Ishmael, which is Hebrew for God hears. He will be a wild donkey of a man. And that image is simply an image of freedom. God is saying, your son will never be a slave as you have been to anyone. He will be wild and free. So not only will she have a son who is free, she will have descendants too numerous to count. So God has something in mind for Hagar. Now, there's a kind of mis- mixed message or a mixed blessing in here, and maybe you noticed it, because God says some things about her not yet born son that would be hard for her to hear and difficult for her to understand. Yes, her son Ishmael will be free, but he and his descendants will be inclined to conflict and struggle. Now, biblical history tells us that Ishmael is the ancestor of the Bedouin peoples and the Arabic peoples. And where Isaac, the child of promise, later to be born to Abram and Sarah, would become the ancestor of the Jewish people. So these two half-brothers share a common father, Abraham. So what do we make of this? Why does God bless Hagar, the Egyptian woman, by protecting her son Ishmael's life if there's going to be conflict later? I think we can only say 
that God has a plan for the descendants of Ishmael. That is, God's story for the Arabic people is not yet finished. That's why we as a church, Chapel Street, support a number of ministries in the Arabic parts of the world because Arabic people, descendants from Ishmael, are coming to Jesus in faith. So the gospel of God is the good news for Hagar and for her descendants. But there's a third gospel we see here, and I'm calling it the gospel according to Hagar. The gospel according to Hagar. As you came into church today, I would guess you were greeted by one of our greeters or by somebody you know here at church. Somebody said, good morning. Somebody said, happy Mother's Day. Somebody said, hello. Somebody said, what's up? Whatever they said. But that's the way we greet each other in our culture. But if we were in Africa today, particularly in parts of Southern Africa, uh, that, is, that comes from the Zulu culture, there was a different kind of greeting you would have heard. The greeting for someone in that part of the world is sawubona, which means I see you. Sawabona, I see you. And the response is either Yebo Sawabona, I see you too, or Shiboka, I am here because you see me. I exist because you see me. That's what we see here in this story. Verse 13. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Be'er Lahai Roi. That's Hebrew for the well of the living one who sees me. What a beautiful phrase. And it's still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. The gospel according to Hagar is, you are the God who sees me. Get this, Hagar, a mistreated Egyptian slave girl, alone in the wilderness, gives a name to Yahweh, God Almighty. She's already learned that God hears. He told her the name of her son, Ishmael, God hears. Now she knows that God also sees. She's discovering that the God of everything, the God who created everything, is not just powerful, and, but yet distant and impersonal. Rather, he's near and he's personal. He's a God who hears and sees. Today is Mother's Day. And today, of all days, in essence, we see our mothers. We, so often what a mother does, and I'm not a mother, but I'm married to one, and I had one. Um, day after day, night after night, what a mother does to care for, to clean up, up, up after, to feed, to comfort, to discipline, just goes unseen and unnoticed. But today, we set aside to see you, to see our mothers, and rightly we honor our mothers. But what if... What if you're a mother who longs to be, a, long, a woman who longs to be a mother, but has not been able to have children as of yet? God sees you, this story says. What if you're a woman who has miscarried and still grieves? The story tells me God sees you. What if you're a single mom and you're going through all this by yourself and you wonder, does anybody know? The story tells me God sees you. Or maybe you're a widow and you no longer feel useful in any meaningful way in your life. You wonder, the story tells me God sees you. Maybe you're a student and you're lonely at school without friends. You wonder, the story tells me God sees you. Or maybe something's in your past that you fear might disqualify you from God's grace. The story tells me God sees you. Or maybe you're just in a season of the wilderness you feel a little bit lost, a little bit at loose edge. You wonder what God's doing in your life. The story tells me God sees you. Here is the gospel of Hagar. Nothing can happen to you that God does not see and hear. Nothing can happen to you that God does not see or hear. Now, you may not see God. Sometimes we don't see what he's up to. We can't understand, but he sees you. So what does it mean to be seen by God? To be seen is to be known. To be seen is to matter. Not just for what you do, not just for how you are used, but for who you are. To be seen is ultimately to be loved. Hagar then says, I have now seen the one who sees me, and she obeys God's command and returns to Sarai. 
She obeys because she now trusts, and she trusts because she knows she is seen and loved. Now, there's one more thing to notice in here. This came from, from a friend. Hagar goes back to Abram and Sarai, gives birth to a son. The Bible tells us that Abram names the boy Ishmael, which means that Hagar had to tell the story. Because God told Hagar the boy's name, she had to tell Abram the boy's name, so he gave the boy the name, Ishmael. But maybe she also told them about the God who sees. Which means now Abram and Sarai knows God sees them too and how they've treated Sarai. So what do we take away from this uncomfortable, messy, painful, and ultimately redemptive story? Here's what we take away. The God revealed most clearly in Jesus Christ sees us as we are. The God revealed most clearly in Jesus finds us where we are, And the God revealed most clearly in Jesus saves us because of who he is. That's the story of Hagar. Will you bow with me as we close? Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this uncomfortable and messy story. A story that reminds us that you are not afraid of our uncomfortable, messy stories. Thank you for being the God who sees the God who finds us, the God who saves us. May we learn to see others as you see them as well. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, it seems fitting this Mother's Day to just say a prayer for the women in our lives who have been so instrumental. And so would you bow with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we praise you for the uniqueness of your creation and your purposefulness in it. We remember today that you humbled yourself to be born of a woman and that you experienced the joys and the pain that are a part of our human relationships. And so for the women who are longing to be mothers but have not had that prayer answered yet, remind them that you are Elroy, the God who sees. For the mother who has lost a child or is estranged from her children, Would you draw near to the brokenhearted? For the ones that struggle with disappointment in their relationship with their own mothers, would we remember that your compassion never fails? For those who have had a recent loss or are anticipating losing a mother soon, would you remind them that you also wept in grief and know their pain? For the ones who have children that have walked away from their faith, we remember that you are a God who pursues. For the mothers who are walking with children who are making poor choices or experiencing painful circumstances, we acknowledge that you can redeem all things. And for those of us who for today is a true celebration, Lord, Would you remind us to give you the glory, to fill us with gratitude, knowing that you love our children more than we can fathom, and that in all these things, you have the power to do more than we can ask or imagine. Would you expand our understanding of your remarkable love for us today, Lord? In your precious name, amen. Thank you. So just a reminder, if you didn't have a chance to scan that QR code and click on that first button, that's that Spring Connection card, we'd love for you to do that if this is your church family. And also there is a precious photo booth out in the back of our lobby if you'd like to take advantage of that today. So now receive the benediction. May we go now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that God who finds, the God who sees, and the God who saves. Amen. Happy Mother's Day.